Hi. Uh, Camille Pissarro, Boulevard Montmartre, 1897. Caillebotte, Jour de pluie à Paris, 1877. Physiologie du flâneur, Physiology of the flâneur. Um, do you feel like you're at an artist's talk yet? So I want to start with um, uh, chatting about the role of an artist. What is the role of an artist? And Charles Baudelaire is the writer we always turn to because his essay, The Painter of Modern Life, is really what defined the role of the artist for many generations to come. And he saw the artist as a bohemian hero, an outsider, I quote, the observer, philosopher, flaneur, and as the painter of the passing moment and of all the suggestions of eternity it contains. Again, I quote, thus the lover of universal life enters into the crowd as though it were an immense reservoir of electrical energy, or we might liken him to a mirror as vast as the crowd itself, or to a kaleidoscope gifted with consciousness responding to each one of its movements and reproducing the multiplicity of life and the flickering grace of all the elements of life. And, um, and the role of the artist, uh, if the role of the artist is to observe and depict and participate, then in the late 19th century, it was all happening on the streets. The Hausmanization of Paris, industrialization, new types of wealth and people. This was a very famous Parisian cafe frequented by Hemingway and Sartre. Uh, this is Simone de Beauvoir and, and Sartre. And this role continued into the 20th century as well. This is San Francisco and the beat generation of the 40s and 60s. Uh, and then we even get to the East Village in the eight, 80s where artist studios were and where artists hung out. And this was a famous, you know, Harry Flanagan and the simulators in 1981. And we even get to, you know, the 1996, this is Christopher Wool incident on 9th Street, uh, the aftermath of, his, of a devastating fire that consumed his studio. So I've taken you through like a very long history here. Uh, to, sh to really explain that there's a real paradigm shift because the changes that are happening today are not happening on the streets, nor are they even linked to place, which can sometimes today feel phantasmagoric, you know, as if they're shaped by influences quite far away, virtual, and online. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm an artist, and I happen to be one of the earliest crypto artists, and that's because I am a flaneur and an observer. So I'm gonna tell you how I got into crypto. So it was um, 2014, and I was in grad school, and I was thinking about the construction of value, very abstractly from first principles, right? Value doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists in a moment of exchange when one is in the place of another which is fundamentally an act of representation. And so I was interested in that moment of exchange. And naturally, I was looking at the history of gold. Right? This is a material that has existed in a feedback loop between cultural and religious significance and financial value across centuries. And, uh, and even the process that led to coming off the gold standard coincided with abstraction and art. Right? Uh, you know, here are examples. Uh, gold and art were always intertwined, and in a sense, gold is a, uh, art is a form of alchemy, right? Taking base materials and transmuting them into something of a higher order. And so this was all kind of swirling in my mind when I heard about Bitcoin. Uh, and immediately, the link to gold is what struck me. And so at the time when I heard about other people starting chains like Litecoin and Dogecoin, I thought, well, as a conceptual performance artwork coming out of relational aesthetics, focusing on the moment of exchange, right? How great would it be to make a currency, right? Which is in a sense the most, the ultimate form of representation. Everything can be represented as it. It's a universal equivalent. And so I, um, you know, I, 
forked Bitcoin <laughs> and made my own meme coin and called it Bitchcoin, which was, you know, a play on words with, you know, the dog influence and a hyper feminine angle to it. And I turned a shipping container unit in Brooklyn into a cryptocurrency mine, mining Bitcoins. And I thought, and you know, um, this was the logo, and at the time, there was really no infrastructure, and no one was gonna download the client that I had set up. So I literally made certificates that had your public key on the front and your private key on the back to give people a representation of, of their token. And you know, here is the proof of the original Bitcoin software. And I thought, well, okay, this is like a two-node chain. Why would anybody want to have it? Uh, and it's so easy to make another one. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna back it like a gold-backed currency. And I'll back it with what I know how to make, which are photographs. And so I wanted to make photographs that were, in a sense, metaphorically linked to what was happening, which was the mining. And so I came up with this construction using two-way mirrors that are uh, these, you know, endless chambers, and the play on, and I called them speculations, which is a play on words on both financial speculation, right, a, a currency backed by speculation, and also specular, right, as in mirrors, and specular relations, in a sense, images that never achieve themselves, and that are like a blockchain, blocks that extend infinitely. And I put it in a safety deposit box, and I put it at the bank, and that was Bitcoin then, right? And it came out in 2015, before Ethereum, making it, in a sense, a proto-NFT. And I realized I had hit on something then because, you know, everybody was very interested. Uh, but just to give you a sense, you know, Ethereum launched, and then shortly, eventually, there was the DAO debacle, which, you know, Ethereum had to fork. and. I was very unsure of my abilities to actually kind of engage in the ecosystem. And so I did other projects that had to do with value. And so I did one project where I manipulated stocks on the New York Stock Exchange and then gesturally redrew the lines as paintings, in a sense, GameStop before GameStop entering the market uh, with the goal of making the line dance for a while, making a gesture, marking a presence. And then I did a project that is essentially uh, the kind of metaphor, the link to bring Bitcoin onto Ethereum, right? Ethereum fulfills the promise of what Bitcoin was, right? Proposing to take art, fractionalize it, tokenize it, put it on chain. And so I needed my, you know, chain was totally defunct and I had thrown away my computer. And so I did this project where I got 16 men to photograph 100,000 rose petals as essentially a giant proof of work. And I had them pick one petal, these are the workers, and they picked one petal per rose that they considered most beautiful, right, as, as a proof of work, which was pressed and is a relic of this performance. And so now, right, Bitcoins are, are backed Bitcoin is migrated onto Ethereum and backed uh, one petal per rose. And essentially, you can submit your, you know, your coin to claim a petal, and then the coin is burned. So it, it is like, a, again, the metaphor to gold is, is preserved. And what's interesting, too, so these are more pictures of the petals. Uh, and what's interesting is also, I, I shot this at Bell Labs, which was the birthplace of the information age, but it's also the birthplace of time stamping. Uh, in 1991, Bell Labs is where Haber and Stornetta wrote the paper on digital time stamping that Satoshi cites. And this is interesting because of you know, the history of time and how it, has, how it is measured has always, always altered our relationship to space and to place. You know, calculators were a feature of agrarian states, but it was the invention of the mechanical clock and its diffusion to all members of society that really started to create a uniform dimension of time that didn't exist before. Again, I'm bringing you back in, in history. And 
eventually the coordination across time zones, which really means the separation of time and space, was crucial for the dynamism of modernity that we saw in the early slides of this presentation. Right? Modern organ organizations are able to connect the local and global in ways that would have been unthinkable in more traditional societies. The point is that innovations around time have always led to changes in society. So back to time stamping, the work of these researchers introduced the idea of a chain of hashes to create a total order of commitments to a, a dynamically growing set of documents. And that is the basis of the blockchain. Um, it's a radical invention in how time is measured and agreed upon. And so obviously there would be changes in our institutions and we're just starting to see them. The change from the organization, which is a feature of modernity, to the protocol. And the transition from the information age to what we are starting to call the transformation age, from centralized Web 2 to decentralized Web 3. It's an innovation of technology, but just as importantly of culture. And crypto rages, and this is what I love, right, is that crypto rages against the hegemony of stagnant systems. It rages against political correctness, against categorization. It shows an underlying desire to break out of control mechanisms. And it is happening. It's unstoppable. Um, and I find it all quite amazing to engage with. I'm, I don't really have a point um, because I'm an artist and not an analyst. <laughs> and I mostly encourage my own creative misinterpretation. And, uh, and so nowadays, I, you know, I've been spending a lot of my time on Bitcoin. Uh, and last month, I opened an exhibition in London, uh, which you might be surprised to learn has nothing to do with crypto. <laughs> there is an augmented reality musical experience in HoloLens and traditional holography, which are both artworks that require the optics of your eyeball and your physical presence. Time and space converge in these pieces, and they can't be dissociated. And, uh, you know, which means a need to have someone in a physical space in the gallery. And so, you know, sometimes people nowadays ask me, like, okay, you, you know, made Bitcoin in 2014, 2015, like, what's next? <laughs> and I can't foresee the future, uh, and, but, and I'm not sure if diffraction gratings, which is the basis of augmented reality, will be installed in all glass surfaces in the future. Um, but if they are, you heard it here first.